Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, honorary president, and your excellency chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and present. Uh, this is a beautiful country, and I think beautiful people. And I'd say first time I've been to Kyrgyzstan, but I think I'm already in love with this place. So again, thank you for the opportunity. I'll talk about technology and global trends. My name is Kashif Rana. <laughs> so, this is my stack. I'll talk about myself, digital transformation, intelligent interfaces, MarTech, no ops, digital twin, and Central Asia. So talking about myself, I grew up in Africa, got my education in London. I'm a SEMA qualified, started my career with Oracle, Stanford University, went to GE, spent 10 years with General Electric in different roles, uh, became a CIO at Coca-Cola, and then joined Etihad Airways and its six airlines, managed their aviation challenges, and then joined Pakistan International Airlines as a give back to my country where I belong from. So that's my journey, my LinkedIn profile. Happy to be connected with all of you in the future. Talking about digital transformation. Digital transformation is a process of future, what do you call, you know, future proofing your organization. It could be organization, it could be a company, it could be government. How do you proof, future proof your organization? The challenge for us today is Every organization is taking a leap and bound going forward into technology. And if we do not get on a technology platform, like our excellency president said, we are going to lag behind. But having said that, digital transformation is not only creating a single app or creating a single website to become digital transformation. Digital transformation is changing the whole set of your business continuity and bringing in a value proposition from end to end. So for example, you don't want to create an application where a, a you know, passenger, which we all relate to, gets on a plane with eight, eight bags, and when he gets down, he has a small taxi waiting for him. That doesn't work. We have to have data transfer to the taxi company saying, this guy is coming with eight bags. How do we make sure that he has the right taxi waiting for him? So making sure that digital transformation is end to end. We don't just get the plane and the passenger on the plane, but we make sure that the data is transferred to our third parties. That's what I call digital transformation. Digital transformation is not picking up a you know, golden, shiny technology and just implementing it for the sake of implementation. It should be integrated across all facets of your organization. So I call it, it's time to move beyond the frontier of random acts of digital. Random acts of digital means you create small digital pieces in your organization and not think about the whole organization strategically. So when I talk about that, how do you, okay, multiple strategies of making sure that you are successful in your digital transformation. Uh, I call them re-platform, retrench, revitalize, replace, or remediate. These are your different blocks of re-transforming your organization. How do you pick those up or combine a couple of them together to transform your organization is up to you, depending on your organization size, its capability. So multiple strategies are there to digitally transform your organization, but picking up these things are aspects. You don't have to really buy new technology every time. You can revitalize your technology. You can remediate your technology in many different ways and forms. And dependability is key. So you want to make sure that goes well. Leap of faith. I, I consider this important because you can't just uh, nibble on technology as an evolution. You need to jump onto new technology platforms. So I call it the leap of faith. So in uh, making sure that you know you, you are on the new technology platform, enabling your organization to the best and the greatest. The challenge for many organizations is they trying to nibble on the technology platform, which is not going to work for them, and many of the projects fail. One of my colleagues will talk about failures in digital projects. That's huge, and I call this leap of faith. The next slide, I have a question for the audience. How many of us are married here? Any raise of hands? A lot of us. So I'm sure you have seen this look on your wife once in a while, right? That means this eyebrow is raised, and it means a lot of things. It can mean, let's leave. I'm not enjoying the party get out of here or sh you know, get quiet. But the meaning of this can only be translated by you. If I see that eyebrow, I cannot know what she's meaning by that eyebrow. So there's good news. The technology has not caught up with this, okay? The technology is behind, but guess what? The technology can tell you that the eyebrow is raised, but it doesn't know what the meaning is. 
So that's the good news, but the bad news is it's catching up very fast. I call that intelligent interfaces. What, is, what are intelligent interfaces? Intelligent interfaces are computer vision. Before, we could see the computer. Today, the computer can see what I'm doing. It can see my stress levels. It can see whether I'm enjoying, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad. So computers have taken a big way forward. So I call them intelligent interfaces. There's a conversation, conversational voice. You can conversate with Alexa. Things are going way forward. Now, uh, lately, Amazon had a competition where it challenged the computer programmers to have a 20-minute conversation with an individual on anything, 20 minutes. That's taking a big leap forward. So as you see, interfaces will increase more and more. Your swiping the phone is going to end one day. We couldn't touch the phone once upon a time. We were pushing buttons. Today, we touch the phone, and this touch is going to go away. The phone just has to look at you. You talk to the phone, and things will happen. So these intelligent interfaces are just going forward as IoT comes in as well. And then you have auditory analysis, advanced augmented reality, and virtual reality. These are going to take more forms, more cooperation as, as more sensors come into, the, into our life, which I'm going to talk about. Chemical sensors, vision. I have biometric sensors, voice sensors, brain waves, gloves, headsets, and sensors. Go, gone too fast, sorry. So these are the future of reading and contacting and working with you through, the f through your computer technology. These are the interfaces that will work for you. There will be f less hand touches on the phone. There will be less talking and putting data into the phone. And these are the kind of interfaces that will start working with us. You'll be hearing and wearing 3D headsets to talk to each other across virtual continents. And we, we are becoming boundaryless as we go forward in this uh, aspect. So these are new real-time context-aware interfaces. And as IoT, Internet of Things, picks up more and more, you will see these sensors and these interfaces to be really working day and night with our surroundings. So they will know more about us than we know about ourselves, believe me. Are you sleeping? Are you waking up? What's the next meeting? Where are you going next? What's your next booking? Are you stressed? We, you know, technology today can see shoppers in shops, whether they are shopping or are they shoplifting. That's where we are today. That's the computer vision that we can see today. But the leaps and bounds that we are forwarding with these sensors and these biometric technologies and gloves is going to be huge. I'm going to walk into the next area of MarTech. What is MarTech? Market. That's beyond marketing journeys. So today, you know, when you type into your computer, you're looking for flowers. Great. What is the reason you're looking for flowers? Uh, why, why? What's the objective? Is it your mother's birthday? Is it your anniversary? Whether you need it for uh, gifting it to a colleague? It's not known. You're just looking for flowers, and Google will put every advertisement out there in front of you. But we as human beings have 7 million, you know, uh, we look at 7 million colors. So there are 7 million colors, I'm sure, in the world. I have, I'm colorblind officially, so I do not know much about that. But we have 20 million nerves that we have in a body that can sense different things. We can all feel different temperatures right now. Somebody's feeling hot, somebody's feeling cold. So we have nerves. We are human, we humans are sensory creatures. And we live through experiences. So these are things that are really, we human beings are made up of. But today, technology is not entertaining any of these right now. It just gives you flower search, and you give 20 different flower types. But going forward, it will be more personalized. It's if, if it knows you, and it knows that it's your mother's birthday coming up, it will only show you your flowers that are meant for giving to your mother. It will not show you every flower out there when you do, do a Google. So marketing is going to take a big, big initiative towards these kind of technologies. And I think this is a great opportunity for our youngsters in Kyrgyzstan to look at this as an opportunity to build platforms on these kind of technologies. Contextualized, it will be context-based. So it all depends where you are, what's happening, and why. I'm sure you get text in different times of the day. Uh, you know, come and buy, buy one, get one free, and you're at home. So the context is, it should not be sending you a text message at the time you're at home. It should only be sending you a text message when you're in a shopping mall. So it has to know where you are. In the future, the technology would know where you are and what to send you where to send you and how to send you, what's the best way to you know, get your attention. So it will be context-based. 
and dynamic end to end. What does dynamic end to end means here? Basically, after you have bought something off the line online and it's too late to talk to you, you're already done. So it has to be real time. If you're looking for flowers or you're looking for a car, you're looking for a ticket to a location, I can't come to you tomorrow and tell you, here's an offer. You already purchased a ticket. So all this has to be real time. I call this marketing technology, MarTech, because it is going to be huge going forward. As you see, Google has become a giant. Facebook has become a giant. Why? Because they know a lot about you. They know your family. They know how many kids you have, the ages they have, and stuff. So how does MarTech system really work? It's going to be driven on data. Data is going to be key. Like our excellency said, data is going to be gold. So how do we build that gold information of our people, our, our consumers, to give them what they want and when they want? So it is going to be customized. It's going to be what you like to have. It's not going to show you every type of flight. If you fly in Europe, it will only show you European flights. If you fly in Asia, it knows your profile. It will only show you what you want to get. If you're going for a vacation, it's going to show you only vacational flights, and it knows that you have two kids, and it will only show you flights with the kids, where it's going to be more uh, you know, family-friendly vacation spots. So it will know you a lot. It will be across channels. So when you look at a um, marketing advertisement from Amazon or something, it will be same on social media, on web, on mobile. So it knows who you are across all channels. It will be outcome-oriented, which means it's not going to go show you anything and everything. It's going to show you exactly what you want. It knows what you want, and that's where it will give you the offers. And as I said, it's going to be real-time dynamic. So this is a great example of using MarTech. MarTech, this is a single show on Netflix. It's called Stranger Things. And these are the different nine advertisements that it has, or trailers you have, of the same movie. So same serial, but it has different ones. And everybody in this audience likes a different picture. If you are a person who likes horror movies, the left bottom line would be something that would entice you. The reason is doing this, it knows what you like. And it will only show you what you want to see. And you will say, guess what? This is what I want to see, because it's another horror show. If you are a, a scout, ex-scout on the middle right here, it's what you like, if you have a scouting background. If you are somebody who likes thrillers, you like the thriller uh, trailer. So what, what is Netflix doing? It knows what you like. It knows what you see. It knows how to entertain you in, into the next show. Once you're done with the last show, it will show you a trailer exactly of what needs to move. I'm already getting notices of my time. No ops. Uh, this is the future of data centers. There will be no servers. It is going to be only operations and outcomes. Basically, you're going to be focused on outcomes rather than managing your operations. There will be no care and feeding of the servers, so there will be no security, maintainability, and reliability challenges on us. We will just go to a data center, put our application, get it running. It could go zero users to 50,000 users without us doing anything. So there will be no operational cost uh, if there's no user. And there are still servers. There will be still maintenance, but very less. It's all, all going to be automated. What does this mean? No manual efforts, no physical servers, no legacy infrastructure for no ops. No ops is the new cloud of the future. DevOps, no ops, and that's where it is. Automated provisioning, scalable infrastructure, push button deployment, automated monitoring, and developer autonomy. Connectivity. I think uh, we spoke about this a little bit earlier with the kind of uh, rural areas we have in, in Kyrgyzstan. I think connectivity is going to be key to successfully implementing technology digitization across the country. Software developed networks, 5G, and then low earth uh, satellites. It works great in you know, areas of mountains where uh, you're required because all this technology needs connectivity. And NFV, network function vir uh, virtualization. These are the few technologies that are going to pick up a lot in the next couple of years. And they have to be uh, you know, key to managing these few connectivities in the future is range, throughput. Your security is going to be key. Your performance, maturity, and strength of these networks, uh, which we explained in the last, uh, last slide. So with that, these are the platforms that have the connectivity in the future. A lot of billions of devices will be connected through Internet of Things in the future. 
VR, AR, virtual reality, augmented reality, and other methods of connectivity will be key in the future of success. Digital twins, I think my gentleman Shaka talked about digital twins. Digital twins are another key aspect of technology that are picking up a lot of noise right now. It's a replica of your real world in the digital world. So it gives you the opportunity to replicate uh, things that you want to perform, maintainability, uh, or even predictive analysis on not the real thing, but your digital environment and gives you the cost saving and also gives you the experience of understanding what all this is. So main technologies that are going to work in this aspect are 3D, IoT, uh, basically, and then connectivity to make sure that you are replicating what's happening in the real environment in your digital and also predicting what's happening in the future. How are we doing on time? Good. These are the three major areas where uh, predictive twins and digital twins will be mostly needed. Manufacturing, healthcare, and automotive. I think what I've talked about in all the technology, if you bring it all together when and talking about these industries, uh, you know, connectivity, MarTech, then digital health, and uh, digital transformation, all these sort of merge together to deliver digital twins and predictive twins. And most organizations are making a lot of effort in this because the, the security and the safety of testing things in real terms versus the digital are huge. You know, you don't want to test new designs of engines on a new plane without testing them in the digital world. Uh, in GE days, we used to have these digital twins where we would put sensors on real planes to read the data on real time and predict how things are going in the engine. But we didn't have digital twins at that time. I like this quote a lot. Change does not necessarily assure progress, but progress immeasurably requires change. It's by Henry, a historian. I liked it, so I shared it with you. Central Asia. Talking about Central Asia. I think Central Asia today, I've been to a couple of countries in Central Asia, and uh, I'm lucky to be here as well. I think I'm, I'm glad that you know, we are thinking from consumption to creation. We don't want to only consume technology, we want to create technology in this Central Asia, which is, which is a very uh, you know, exciting road I see in the front. And I see talent. I have seen uh, our colleague SAP has a big center in Sofia. Uh, I think there's more opportunity to bring more centers of excellence in uh, Kyrgyzstan here. And I think the young generation you have of uh, technology enthusiasts and the Central Asian University providing computer technology studies is going to be a great mixture of what do you call making the right mix here? How do we get there? I think we need to build relationships with the Western countries and European countries. That's critical. How do we get ourselves out there to provide services, become the center of excellence for them to rely on us? We also need to understand how the valley, Silicon Valley, when I talk the valley, operates with governments and citizens. So we have to learn from them how is the best way to do that. And then we need inspiration and tools and that's important for us. Um, time up, last slide. Technology stun. Okay, uh, land of technology. How do we make Kyrgyzstan the land of technology? We need e-government, more emphasis on e-government, getting more, more of your services on the fly. We need online presence for all big companies uh, across, the uh, across the country. It will drive more, more uh, retain of, uh, retention of talent, hiring of talent in the local place. We need women to be involved. Women in tech is very important. We need non-formal education. So you can train people in three months on a new technology without a bachelor degree, get them into the production line. And we need a lot of incubators. With that, thank you so much. And I appreciate it. Keep in touch and keep connected. Thank you.